All right. It's kind of nice hearing my voice on a nice, loud sound system. Well. All right, uh, so welcome to the Growth Crash Course. I will be teaching you how to do growth, um, whether you're an early stage startup or you are an early stage startup, early or later stage startup. Moving on. Uh, so I'll go really quickly over where I've worked. Um, so Coinbase, Angelus, Strava, Haven, Airbnb. Haven, like, Haven was a tiny seven person startup and I think when you think about growth, it's really nice to know exactly how large the companies you, you are working with, right? So what worked at Haven when it was a seven person startup is very different from when I was working at Airbnb. Working at Coinbase where I'm working in Web3 and crypto is very different from when I worked at Strava. So the nice thing about growth is that once you start learning about growth, you can take those learnings and move it somewhere else and generalize it and kind of adapt it to fit the correct niche. Um, so without, so I'm a product manager, so obviously I had some goals with this talk, um, and the goals is basically this. One, I want to make sure that everybody has a pretty solid foundation of how to do growth across multiple channels. And the second one was that I wanted to make sure that I provided concrete examples and insights every single step of the way. Um, I think this is super important because when you talk to people about growth, it's really easy to go very, very high level, and most people aren't able to provide, you know, very, very deep insights onto what's worked for them and what doesn't work for them. So hopefully you get that. Um, so the very first thing that I'm gonna tackle, this is really boring, what is growth, right? Um, so all companies grow, but startups are defined by growth, and I like to use growth with a capital G. Um, and I define it by the process in which you are very intentional about growing. Um, this is the things that you do in order to get more people onto your platform, to get them to re-engage, to get them to perform very, very high intent things. Um, so the very first thing I like to, actually, so this is, this is the agenda, right? I'm going to talk about funnel optimization, then I'm going to go to acquisition, virality, and then activation and engagement. And I'd like to start with funnel optimization because this is a very fundamental growth, growth concept. And I think everybody's, everybody here has heard of it, everybody's almost done it, but it's very applicable to all areas of your product, not just growth, and it's a really nice way in order to kind of dip your feet into growth if you've never done it before. Um, and it's, I like to break it down to three steps. First one, break down your product into discrete steps. This is the user journey. This is how people are going through things. The second one is discovering the inefficiencies. And the third one is to fix them. Uh, step one and step three are super, super easy. It's not difficult in order to break it down to steps. And then it's very easy to fix them outside the engineering problems. But the hard part actually is figuring out where the inefficiencies are. Um, so in order to do that, my favorite place to start working on growth if you've never done it before, is sign up and onboarding. Because sign up and onboarding is already a natural funnel. There are steps that your user has to go through in order to onboard, and there's a very, very, very clear uh, goal that they need to go through. Um, so on top of that, every user that goes through onboarding is high intent. If they're on onboarding, they want to get to your product, and you want them to get to the end, which means that any change you make is gonna have a very, very, very high impact. Um, and the funny thing is, is that for as key as this is, almost every company I've ever worked with, sign up and onboarding is very under-optimized. And it kind of makes sense because when you're a smaller company, and, or sorry, if you're an earlier stage startup, you're trying to build things as quickly as possible, so you're gonna build out your onboarding funnel, and then you're gonna move on to building out the actual product. And when you're a larger company, uh, the onboarding funnel is probably one of the oldest things in your code base, and it's a kind of a pain in the butt in order to actually fix. So um, because of that, it's usually really complex in order to fix, but it has really, really high return. So um, with that, I'm going to walk you through how we did it at AngelList. So these slides are really small, but step one, if you remember, is to break everything down into discrete steps. So we break this down to pre-onboarding, onboarding, and post-onboarding. So for pre-onboarding, you hit the home page, Fine, you go hit sign up, and then you enter the onboarding process. Then this is a seven step process in order for you to actually finish. Um, so what do we do next? Try to figure out what the inefficiencies actually are. In which case, the very first thing we do is we look at amplitude. So we have gone ahead and built out um, the instrumentation in order to see what the steps users, what steps users are going through and where the actual dropoffs are. So from this step, we know that our onboarding funnel had a 30% conversion rate, and there was a pretty big drop in between some steps. Then after that, I'm gonna steal Holly Lou's uh, saying, where data kind of lights up the room, but it doesn't tell you where to move it. So even if you know where 
things are bad, you don't exactly know what you need to fix, in which case then you start to rely on different things. So we use uh, we used full story in order to look at user sessions. You can see how users are clicking around, what they're doing. And then on top of that, we also did some UXR interviews in order to figure out, like, in order to get actual feedback on how customers were using the product. And what we found out was that at the very top of the page, you can see we have this very, very, very vague bar that just kind of fills up. And like, because it just fills up, you don't know what steps you're going through. You don't know how much time you need. You don't know how close you are to finishing it. Users are very confused about the title. They were confused about a lot of things um, just from looking at you know, all the feedback that we had. So this is what we ended up doing. So we, what we did was we went ahead and made it a little bit more clear about what, what steps you need to go through. We went ahead and made the steps a little bit more concrete, and we added some nice little like, messages to say, save and continue, because that means that, we, that they are not losing where they are. But the most important thing that we did, and it's not on the slides, I apologize, is that we reduced the number of fields that you actually need to go and input. So I think like, one of the things that we found out was that we asked for your location four times. So that's like, where do you work? Where do you live? San Francisco, San Francisco, San Francisco. So what we did is we just consolidated into one single field. And that way, the less fields a user has to fill out, the less chance that you introduce friction and they don't make it through. The last thing that we did was actually very interesting in that you can go ahead and so we took the, there's a, you need to upload your resume at one point. We took the resume, we moved it to the very end of the funnel. Because when you need to upload a resume, it's a very, very, very high amount of friction. You have to go find it on your desktop and upload it. And by moving it to the very end, the interesting thing is that because you go through all these steps, answer all these questions, is that you're so invested in finishing the onboarding process that you're going to go ahead and upload, upload the resume anyways. Whereas if you had the resume up first, and you're like, ah, this is too much work. I'm not going to do it. So by doing that, doing all that, we increase, the, we increase conversion rate from 30% to 60%. And the more important thing is, is not only did more people convert, they actually started doing more job searches. And this is super important because not only are users finishing the funnel, they're performing something else that is very, very intentful. All right, now we're going to move on to acquisition, in which case I will be talking about SEO and paid marketing. I've already talked a little about conversion rate optimization, so we're going to move on a little bit from there. So SEO is really nice because it's free user acquisition. Whereas with paid marketing or performance marketing, you, you have to go and pay for it, right? And in times of where it's a bear market or you're hitting a recession, um, SEO gets a little bit more attention just because, you know, it's, uh, it's free. You don't need to pay for it. And for SEO to work as an acquisition strategy, it's a function of both quantity and quality. You want to have a lot of pages, and the pages need to be very, very high quality. By high quality, there's an SEO saying, content is king. The more content you have on the page, the more successful, successful your pages are going to be in the Google search results. Um, and this is, I usually break this down into two different steps, either programmatic or content. So we're going to go with programmatic first. So programmatic basically means let's go and generate as many decent pages as possible. They don't have to be great pages, but you, like, they don't have to be great pages. They could be kind of okay pages, um, but you're really good for quantity over quality because what you're trying to do is you're trying to generate as many pages as possible to bring for as many keywords as possible. Um, and this is a very scalable strategy, and it minimizes the amount of risk that you have to invest in SEO. Um, but it's not an option for every single company, so you have to think about whether or not this is going to work for you. Um, so to look at Airbnb, Airbnb has a lot of city pages, right? Places to stay in San Francisco, places to stay in Helsinki, places to stay for every single city in the world. Zillow, lots of house pages, Instacart, a lot of product pages, Zapier, a lot of integration pages. You can see how this would work out. Um, and as an example, I worked with this company called Spot Angels. And what they do is they provide parking information for specific cities. And what we ended up doing is we created these pages so they can make for places to park near, uh, the Statue of Liberty, places to park near Golden Gate Park. And by creating all these pages, they went in three months from 60 visitors a month to 100,000. And the only thing that's limiting them is the amount of information that they have in order to create more pages. But why don't we take a look at somebody that does not a great job at it. So if you look at Ramp, they have these pages called Travel and Expense Management in whatever industry, right? They have a bunch of these. This is the first page. Uh, T and E, which is, that's, that means nothing to me, for logistics companies. And then the second one is for prop tech companies. Look at these pages. Like, there's, 
nothing is really different about them, except maybe they use a different image and the header is a little bit different. And what ends up happening is Google has no idea what, what these pages are. So if you Google management software for real estate, comp real estate companies, it shows management solutions for e-commerce. Google has no idea what these pages are. These are terrible SEO pages, and like, their programmatic strategy isn't particularly working. But let's move on to content. So with content, content is fun because you get to be very, very targeted on the keywords that you want to rank for. So if you are a skincare company, you can go and I want to write a page for a skincare routine, in which case you can go and target for very specific keywords, but it's really high risk because it doesn't always work and you're putting a lot of effort into creating very, very high um, quality content. So if you do want to pursue content, this is the general rule of thumb, is that you probably want to start with a blog post and landing pages. I usually try to start off with uh, trying to make for keywords that get about 250 searches a month, um, just because the competition is going to be lower, and usually lower volume uh, keywords are going to have a much higher user intent, so they will convert more. Um, and then once you get that going, then you can target bigger keywords after, 1,000 plus, 2,000 plus, et cetera. But for all of SEO results, you should see them in about one to three months. Um, I think a lot of SEO experts say, oh, it'll take like six months to a year. They're lying to you or they're not that great at SEO. Uh, moving on, paid marketing. Um, paid marketing is fun because it's very, very easy to spin up, which also means it's super easy to lose money. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna do this, you need to be very careful and very thoughtful about your strategy. And this is also usually the first acquisition channel for a lot of different startups. Um, so I would say that if you want to do paid marketing, you should do this after you <laughs> do this when you make money or you are charging, because paid marketing is entirely about how efficiently you are able to spend. Your customer acquisition cost cannot outweigh the LTV. If it costs more money to acquire a customer than, for your, than the customer is worth, then you're just going to be bleeding cash. So you need to know these two numbers in order for you to actually do this. Um, efficiently. So for small startups that want to try doing this, my, big, my biggest piece of advice is try out different channels because you don't know what works depending on where you are. So Google is always a really, really good place to start. It's always fantastic. This is, this is how they make all their money. Uh, Facebook has been great, but recently not so good. Um, Twitter's never been good. Um, especially with the recent news, maybe they'll be even worse. So I would maybe not do Twitter. Um, and I find influencer marketing to be pretty interesting now. But really, what you're trying to do when you're doing performance marketing, you need to know exactly where your customers are and go and try and buy ads there. So if you are a, let's say, a more developer API focused company, right? If you like buying ads on Stack Overflow is probably going to be much more efficient than anything you do on Google, Facebook, Twitter, or influencer marketing. Um, and then for the larger companies out there, this is a study that we did at Airbnb. So this is a quote from our head of performance marketing. If you guys don't know what branded searches are, it's searches that have your brand name in it, right? So for Airbnb, it'd be Airbnb San Francisco, um, Airbnb Helsinki. So, like people, people are typing in your brand, branding keyword in order to, in order to like, you know, navigate around your website. Uh, what Airbnb ended up finding out was that like, it's not super incremental, it's about 15% incremental that you're getting, but it was ridiculously efficient, which means that it was really cheap in order to buy the keywords and then get, the, get users onto your website and actually bring in money. So um, there's always been this fight on whether or not um, branded search conflicts with SEO, and what we found in Airbnb was that it, it was really fine in order to have both of them coexisting. Uh, and my favorite thing to talk about is virality, just because uh, it is pretty deep. So virality can go to referrals, word of mouth, social sharing, things like that. I'll mostly be focusing on referrals for this, for, for this talk. Um, and it's fun because it's one of the most nuanced channels that you can actually go into. Because you can grow your user base super, super quickly, and they will go ahead and advocate for you all. They will advocate for you, which is really, really cool. Um, but it needs to be very thoughtfully created because a lot of bad things could happen, because it kind of relates back to the customer acquisition cost I was talking about earlier, where if it costs you more in order to get a referral than you know, your users are generating, then you'll just start bleeding money. Um, yeah, I actually just talked about this. Um, I think the only thing I want to say here is probably the last bullet point. Um, copying other successful companies may not be the best idea, because referrals is really weird in that your company's positioning 
um, what your customers are like is going to have a really, really big difference on what an effective referral strategy is, gonna, is going to be. So I'm going to talk about Robinhood because Robinhood is probably the best at virality period that I've worked with, and I really like their referral program. Um, so the first step for Robinhood, or I guess for anything, is that when you have a referral program, you need to figure out how a user is going to get there. If a user doesn't know where to go, they're not going to be able to actually refer anybody. So if you look in the upper right, it says rewards. That's how you get to the referral program. But the interesting thing about this is that I think like three or four years ago, I would Uber, Lyft, and Airbnb to substitute for their referral program. We didn't use rewards. It just said free $15, and like users would click on it in order to, get, in order to discover the actual referral. Um, so anyways, this is one thing that you can optimize, is how do users go ahead and actually find out how to get to your referral program. The next step, once you get there, this is, this is fun, uh, is this page says, invite friends, pick your free piece of stock. And when you think about referrals, there's three different ways to look at it. It's either selfish, altruistic, or quid pro quo, which is you scratch my back, whatever. Uh, but the way that Robin does this, it's very, very selfish because what it says is that you get the free piece of stock, not the other person. And that's an interesting, like, that's an interesting thing because what we found in Airbnb was that the quid pro quo works a lot better, saying, oh, you get $5 and your friend gets $5 as well, worked a lot better in terms of messaging as well as a strategy. So for Robinhood, what we can assume here is that their users are pretty selfish, and this is fine. Like, I'm not, being, them being selfish isn't a bad thing, but this is what they found. Um, so if you go get the link and you share it, the first thing you see, that, like let's say I sent to my friend Holly. Holly goes and looks at it and it says, your free stock is waiting for you. Again, they're playing back into the selfish bit. It was like, oh, you need to go get this free stock. And then the other thing is that it says, Brian invited you to join 18 million plus people in Robinhood. This is just social proof. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. This is pretty nice. I do want to point out a little bit of a, of, I want to point out their CTA which I know is a micro-optimization, but it's just fun, right? It says claim your free stock, which is very, very different to a user than get your free stock, because claim means that you already own it. You just need to grab it, where get feels like it's a little bit more of an activation energy. So um, they've definitely optimized the hell out of this page, and it's very inter interesting in order to see what they've done. Um, so then it says you're on your way, but first your email, they ask you to input your email, and you hit continue. And then when you hit continue, it takes you to just the sign-up page. It doesn't do anything. It, like, it, like, if you look up there, ask, you ask my first name, my last name, and then my email address again. But by getting your email address here, what they get is now they can go and email you saying, hey, you forgot your referral. Remember to go claim your free stock, because now, because now they have your email address. They know that you came in through this page, and now they can hit you back up. Um, so I would say that, like, for the most part, Robinhood's referral strategy is pretty solid. The only thing that I would really worry about is how they go and look at their email address. Because like, if you ask for the email address back here, just fill it back in once you hit the sign-up page. Uh, and then the, I ran one referral strategy at Haven, and Haven was a fintech company. You can go and store a bunch of money in the bank. Um, and we did it so that every single time you referred a friend, you would get an extra 0.25% of APY, up to 4%. If you don't work in FinTech, a 4% APY is ridiculous. That's a lot of money. But this didn't work. And it didn't work because there was absolutely zero dopamine hit for getting 0.25%. What really works is do not delay the dopamine hit. People want money or a monetary equivalent. If you, give them, if you can give them money, if you give them $10 for signing up, give them $10. If you can, if you can give them $15 in Uber credit, give them $15 in Uber credit. But really, the monetary reward is what drives referrals. And if you do not give people money, it's just not going to work. Um, be thoughtful in your reward system. Again, I mentioned the, the selfish, altruistic, and quid pro quo. Um, think about how you want to position yourself in your brand when you do that. Um, and referrals is really, really, really good early on. But I would say as you get bigger and you hit market saturation, you do need to revisit referrals in order to figure out the incrementality of this. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about is activation and engagement. In specifics, I'm going to focus on both email and push. So for push and email, there's different levels of urgencies based on the different channels. So for push, push is very, push is, push is annoying. It's like, oh, this is a problem that you need to go look at immediately. Whereas email's a little bit more delayed, so you can go and take your time with it. So be more selective when you send out push notifications because 
you can push for a lot of uh, for a lot of user interactions, but you can also get them to unsubscribe if they find it too annoying. Um, and the other thing that you should definitely be thinking about is you should be thinking of everything in terms of user life cycles, right? So, like everybody knows, like if you're going to send an email, send it, like you know, send it to send out specific messaging to people that are 18 to 25 and 26 to 32. But it's much less about thinking about that and more like where are your users in the life cycle of your product? A user that signed up a week ago is expecting very, very different things than users that signed up six months ago. So if you haven't defined user life cycles, I would 100% do it because not only is it helpful for other areas of growth, it's going to be very helpful as you go figure out this push and email strategy as well. Um, and then last two things I want to talk about, unsubscribes are forever. I don't think, if a user unsubscribes, I don't think there is a way to get them to read, subscribe back to an email or push notification. People just, people don't like emails. So if, whenever you burn a user, they are burned forever. So be very, very careful in how you're doing this and if you're annoying the hell out of your users because you don't want to do that. Um, and then uh, I think everybody knows this, GDPR is scary as hell. Uh, be very careful how you're storing your user data and how you're sending out emails and make sure you don't break any laws because it will get very, very, very expensive. Um, so the biggest tip that I have that I got from my friend was that you need to send users the right content at the right time. And this is really important, um, especially when you think about low intent emails. So low intent emails are emails where you send users an email and hope they do something um, when they didn't ask for it. And this didn't work at Airbnb. Because like, what a low intent email looks like, it looks like this. It says, take the trip, let's travel, and they give me a bunch of suggestions. One, I didn't ask for a trip. <laughs> I'm not planning for a trip. And me going for a trip is not going to, it's not related to Airbnb at all. Um, because traveling is rare. Traveling doesn't happen all the time. And even if we show nice listings, the user quality is going to be super low and the conversion is going to be super low. So what you're, you end up doing is you're just spamming your users with like, hey, look, check out this cool thing that we have. And they're going to be like, well, I don't really care about this. And they're going to leave. People don't travel because they see nice listings. They travel because they want to. Um, so if you look at this email, it's just not a great email to be getting. Um, instead, what I like to focus my time on is on event-based emails. This is where you see the most success because this is where users have engaged and shown intent. So like if somebody is on your platform and they're interacting and they're doing something, like send them emails based on that information. So um, I think like the most recent one I got that I thought was useful is this eBay one because I was looking at climbing shoes and I forgot about it and just left it alone. And then I went and continued to do something else. But eBay knows that I looked at, eBay knows I looked at this climbing shirt. They know that I'm interested in this on some, some sort of level. And now that there's only one left, they send me an email saying, hey, come back to it. Why don't you go look at this, look at this shoe again. Um, and like, this is actually helpful because I have shown interest in this. I want to know when this shoe is going to be available. And now they've told me that, oh, there's only one left. So these event-based emails are really, really critical in order to engage with your users because you're, pro you're providing a lot more information to them than you would with like these really terrible low intent emails. Nobody cares about this. People care much more about this. Um, so lessons, uh, push notifications I've learned should be pretty consistent sends. Um, like if you were able to send consistent valuable push notifications, then people will find value out of it and they won't unsubscribe and they'll perform an intentful action. Um, the best time to engage with the users is right after they sign up because they sh they've shown a lot of intent. They know exactly what they want from your product. They've done something. Now you can start walking them through the process of what you need to do in order to get the most value out of your product. Um, Taiwan platform matters for users at, whenever you engage with them, right? This goes back to the user lifecycle stuff that I was talking about. And you should send things that matter. And the next slide is actually my favorite slide. Um, I interviewed my... Uh, my friend that worked was a PM on, uh, on, at Airbnb on emails. So the first tip, first tip she gave me, don't send fluff garbage, which is pretty obvious. Um, but then everybody likes to go optimize subject lines. She's like, subject lines don't need to be, sh don't need to be short, and don't waste a ton, ton of your time on this. Test like three. And my favorite line ever is, the best time to send an email is when you have something fucking relevant to send them. So if, you, if the most relevant email you can get, you're sending, is Friday at 5 p.m., send that email. Um, so in conclusion, growth should be laid down as a foundation. It can always be optimized later. And this is a really important thing to be thinking about, is that you can, like, you can go and start spin up your SEO thing right now and let it sit around for a couple of weeks, or a couple of months, or even a year or two, and that's fine. 
Um, know how to balance opportunity and optimization, because this is really important when you're a big company and you're a small company. If you're an early stage startup and you spend too much time uh, you know, like optimizing and running A-B tests, you're going to get lost in the weeds. And I've seen tons of companies get really lost because they want to go and test everything. As a small startup, the, your po the point of your product, what you want to be doing is you want to launch things as quickly as possible, right? Like, the example I like to use is if you go check out, if you run an e-commerce website, you're not, you're not going to go A-B test a checkout button. You need, the, you need to have a checkout button. So if you're a small company, don't, don't get too lost in the optimization, running A-B tests, launch things and launch them quickly. Um, and yeah, the last thing that I want to go over is uh, my favorite thing about growth is that you should ship fast and learn quickly. You should always be iterating. And if you ever fail, that's fine because like failure is how you learn. The biggest problem I, I find with like growth teams is pe like, once people are scared to fail, that's when like that's when your company starts to stagnate. So as long as you go and like are always trying to learn from everything that you launch and every experiment that you run, you're in pretty good shape. And um, that's it. Thank you for your time. Hopefully that was uh, pretty helpful.